Welcome everyone and thank you for attending this Global Tech webinar on Japan. It's an absolute pleasure for the AAA to be able to host these informative webinars with our valued partners at Austrade. We have record registrations for today's Global Tech webinar, so Japan and its market must be of enormous interest. This event is being recorded and we will be made available on the AAA member portal. Let us now begin by acknowledgement of country. Um, we need to recognise the tens of thousands of years of innovation that have been handed down through the generations from the original custodians of the lands we meet on today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land. Uh, for me here in Canberra, that is the Ngunnawal people. I also pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Just before I hand over to our Austrade colleagues and our wonderful panellists, just some housekeeping. You can see on the screen in front of you a QR code and a uh, slido.com reference there, which is a URL. Please take time to scan that uh, code or enter slido.com into your browser. That will be how you'll be able to ask questions today to the panelists. So please, uh, please take the time to do that. And it's now my pleasure to hand over to David Camalengo to give a welcome from Austria. David. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Simon. And uh, welcome to everybody. And thank you for joining us here today. Um, so my name is David Camalengo. I head up our uh, technology and advanced manufacturing uh, sector strategy team here at Austrade. We have embarked a little bit of background on this global tech webinars, and I'm sorry for those that have heard me say this before and have joined us for other webinars, but welcome back. Um, this really is intended to shine a bit of a spotlight on uh, various markets and overseas markets. Um, in terms of what's happening, there could be opportunities for Australian technology firms to perhaps capitalise on. So we've had quite a significant focus across Asia, um, uh, significant focus in Southeast Asia, and now we're starting to move up into Northeast Asia with this webinar uh, here on Japan. Um, and, and it's really intended to kind of, uh, I guess, learn a little bit about the market itself, what's happening from in terms of the technology sector in that market, um, but also hear from some of the Australian businesses like we are pleased to have here today on their journey as well that could uh, potentially be relatable for other Australian technology companies. So um, without any further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Austrade's um, Trade and Investment Commissioner for Japan based out of Tokyo, Vivian Lim, who's gonna manage proceedings for today. Over to you, Vivian. Thank you, Simon and David, and welcome everyone to today's webinar. By way of introduction, my name is Vivian Lim and I am the Trade and Investment Commissioner in Tokyo. It is my pleasure to moderate the session today. I have three um, guest speakers who uh, each have great insights and experiences to offer. But first I would like to provide everyone with some context of what is happening in Japan in regards to startups. The last several years in corporate Japan has seen a groundswell of change. Up until recently, Japan, Japanese companies have relied on the model of incremental technological advancements that was achieved through internal R&D. This model is rapidly shifting to one in which collaborations with external partners are being used to accelerate innovation. This is a very welcome development for us in Australia, which is seen as the hidden gem in the rough. Japanese companies have technology scouts in Silicon Valley, Israel, Europe, China, and Singapore, but are increasingly telling Austrade that they now want to turn their attention to Australia. At this year's Innovation Leaders Summit, for example, the largest matchmaking event for startups in Asia, Australian startups secured more meetings than any other country. This is but one of many positive proof points that demonstrate the growing interest in Australian startups. But converting this interest into commercial relationships will not be easy. Today's masterclass webinar has been designed specifically to circumvent these pain points. It will give you insights and practical tips from the practitioners on the ground who have successfully expanded into the Japanese market. We have a fantastic agenda today. Firstly, I'm delighted to be interviewing Mr. Suji Ueyama from Canva to share some of their insights and their recent successes in the Jap Japanese market. 
following this, Mr. Rashid Kosla from Industrial Growth Platform Inc, IGPI, will share some of his insights on the strategic aspects of Japanese and Australian companies' collaboration and some tips from his experience. Then we have Mr. Joshua Flannery from Innovation Dojo Japan, who is on a mission to grow Japanese tech and talent, uh, the, a talent pipeline. Josh will be sharing more on business to business uh, development uh, in Japan. We're using Slido today to capture any questions you have for our speakers. Head to slido.com and enter the code hash global tech or you will see the QR code throughout which um, will take you directly throughout the slides, which will take you directly to the page. Feel free to drop your questions in at any time and we'll have a few questions at the end of today's session for Q&A before wrapping up. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Mr. Suji Ueyama to the session. Canva is an Australian unicorn founded in 2012 and it's already in 190 countries. Suji has grown the Japanese market for Canva since 2019. Before Canva, Suji worked at Dropbox Japan and has also helped grow self-serve revenue for Japan and also other Asian countries. Welcome, Suji. Thank you very much, Vivian. Thank you for the warm welcome. And uh, yes, and oh, let me, oh, you, you did the intro, so I, I have a, I have I prepared a quick intro. Yeah, my name is Shuji Wema, and uh, yeah, uh, this, originally I'm from Tokyo, and I moved to Sydney in 2019 when I joined Canva. And I have two missions at Canva. One is growing, grow the Japanese market, and second is improve the uh, product through hyper localization at Korea, Mexico, and Indonesia. And uh, other than that, what I love, I used to jump with my bicycle, BMX. I used to compete seriously, but I hit my body so many times. So now I'm relaxing a little bit more. And now I'm into climbing a lot. And on the weekends, I love cooking. So that's my quick intro. Let's go, Vivian. Thank you. Okay, so I've got some questions prepared um, for you, Suji, so that um, you can share your experience. So Japan has a very well-developed digital infrastructure, a highly skilled workforce, and it's at the leading edge of technologies such as robotics, yet many small firms are lagging behind in adopting digital tools. Hmm. With this complex balance, can you provide some insights into what were the driving factors for Canva choosing to expand into Japan? Okay. I love the question. Uh, well, first of all, uh, well, our mission, like Canva's mission is to empower the world to design. So it is natural to pro provide our service in Japanese. So, and our product is, has been used at 191 countries. Yes. And, and the next, I think the, and and this is I think this is much much important. What what are the reasons we are prior to we are prioritizing Japan, like out of one hundred ninety countries? Like and uh, yeah, there's a couple of re three reasons we can think of. One is that Japan is the number three GDP country, and also GDP per capita is great compared to in, um, among to among many countries. And number two. Japan has a nice digital infra infrastructure with many highly educated people. And number three, like, and our CEO and CEO like, like Japan. And uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, those personal reasons are important, I think. And, and uh, like, I, don't know, I, I have been growing the Japanese market for multiple com companies and uh, like, love to share some of the basic in insights and uh, one is well japan has a, like a large internet population like not only normal one but fast internet users fast internet environment users 
around 10 million people, nice number. And, and this is interesting, like Japan has a huge iPhone share versus Android when it comes to mobile. And uh, for SaaS company, usually iPhone users has uh, a higher monetization rate. So when it comes to like, yep, generating revenue, that is important. Well, that leads to the second, second insight. Like, yeah, Japan has a high monetization rate with high lifetime value. So that's good when we are doing business. So like, and this is what important, like many SaaS like products have like free, 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 you can use the product for free, like Canva, Dropbox, or many products. And then uh, you want to try the premium product for like, let's say 30 days for free, and then like 30 day free trial, and then upgrade to a subscri un subs subscription. Then you really buy it. So it is important. It is so compared to other countries, this is only from my insight from Dropbox and Canva, like Japan has a like low percentage of like from free user to trial going to trial conversion rate. But Japan has a, a super high percentage of like from trial users to actually purchase the uh, actual product to subscribe. So that is very interesting. And in terms of business users, like small business adopts cloud tools in the early stage. And, uh, and that will be, become the bread and butter first. And many ent enterprise companies have like, have like cloud allergy, that was, I would say, or high security requirements. That, so that'll be a nice, a, a, no, not nice, a big hurdle to get them use the product. Yes, so yep, that's it for me, Vivian. Great, thank you. I've got another question. Oh, yeah. So as a small team uh, and an Australian scale up, entering such a large and established market, can you share some of the challenges of doing business in Japan that Canva experienced when entering the Jap Japanese market? How did you overcome these challenges? Oh, of course, I'm very, very happy to share those. Oh my God. Uh, okay. Let, uh, yeah, this is w one of my favorite stories. Like when I joined Canva, we had a local partner and uh, they're like, you know, uh, they're a subsidiary company of a huge telecom company. And they're, they, like, they say like, hey, we know the market and leave it to us so we will take care of it and they were trying and uh and and with though with them like but we japan was not growing like other countries other countries were like growing like more uh, faster and more uh, and aggressively and uh, so like when i joined canva like uh we had a we already had a partner and they're in Japan. So I get to like speak in their language. So I first I I thought my my job is to make them high performing. So I created strategy and we work together. But it was at the end of the day it was not that great. So uh so I had to like uh, I had to terminate the contract at the end of the day after I don't know, like after six months and uh, and like my one of the big learning was like well why why like then I thought to myself why this partnership is not working uh, the partner worked on the th things that they want to do not the things makes the biggest impact. And uh, they were not great at, uh, they, they didn't have any strategy. So like, and uh, I, I, I learned like strategy is important. And after that, like, after we terminate the contract with the partnership, the next day I'm the only guy who is in charge of growing the Japanese market. So voila, I'm, I'm alone. Then the next challenge comes like, okay, 
when where where to start when our team was small like basically it was just me and you know canvas out canvas awareness was so low back at like three three i don't know three, three years ago so first like i focused on seo and aso aso is app store optimization like it's like seo like in the apple app store or google play store so for seo we approach from the cross point of user intent and our product offer with like with a huge demand or with a huge search volume like example is like the user intent like uh the person who wants to design a logo and our offer is we can create a logo at canva at ease so we will we'll i'll we we'll research for like a keyword like uh logo design or low and logo creation and find out how many users are searching so we 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 invest in seo first and aso and slowly grow the discovery for our users and then like as the team grows like one by one uh i we we get to do many more things like PR and social medias and product hyper localizations and things. Yeah, hope that answers your question, Vivian. Yeah, that sounds amazing, Suji. Um, and you fired your partner in half <laughs> half a year and then transformed it. So there's something to be learned from that with partnerships, isn't it? Yes. Um, yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Can I add one more? Like, oh my God, partnership. Okay. Like, so in my case, like our partnership that didn't work, it was not great. And, uh, but uh, I saw like other com companies, like, well, I don't uh, like if I can say, I don't know, uh, like Udemy and Benesse, Udemy, it's an online like education platform. They partner with Benesse. We, Benesse is the largest education company in Japan, and they partnered together, and and uh, and their partnership is like seems to work super great. So like, okay, there's like like great partnership and not great partnerships. So like, okay, it, it was very very interesting for me to see to see, actually see the great great case of the partnership too. Mm, indeed. So another question uh, that I was thinking about is, is an important consideration when entering any market is culture and localization of the product or service mm. you're offering. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about Canva's experience with the Japanese market? Will Canva recreate um, all the digital assets in the Japanese language? Is that important? Great question, Vivian. Of course, we like uh, we have a, a localization platform, so all the languages are like translated. But we are design platform, so only language translation is not enough. So we do a lot. We have been doing a lot of things. Let me share some of those. One is like design templates. Canva, like one of our strength is providing user a beautiful design templates. And there are like basically like two types of design templates. One is localized templates. And second one is bespoke templates that we said. And one, the first localized template is uh, English, it's the translated templates from English templates. And the second one, bespoke templates is, is a template Temp design template created by the Japanese designers. So like the second one is very, very natural. So what we did is first, like we powered up bespoke template creation. And this is a presentation, uh, bespoke uh, presentation templates that is so Japanese. And this is some wedding ceremony, uh like design templates oh this is for like uh, uh yeah rsvp uh, uh postcard oh and uh and and now we 
created, like we already created over 3000 of those bespoke templates. So, and, and because it's created from scratch, we can like create uh, like a very, very local specific needs. For example, we have a, like a, Japan has a very like formal wrapping paper or or resume. Let's let's talk about resume. Resume, like when it comes to like a Japanese resume, we don't. Uh, in Canva, we have like a very stylish design, stylish resume templates. But most of the Japanese people, we don't use stylish templates. We use like we have like a very white, plain, basic template. So we created those for the Japanese market. And that is number one, bespoke templates. Yeah. And number two, like improved localized templates in like this, I did it, I found, I, 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 kicked, I kicked off this project and uh, I find out this is, this can be scaled at many countries. So we did. And this is what, what this is one of the localized templates. It says, I'm proud of my dad. I'm, pr I'm proud of my awesome dad. And the text is in, in Japanese, but the photo is not Japanese. So this is not cool from my point, like from my point of view. So we refine the like templates with the same text. The font is just a little bit different. Yeah, it's it's more, yeah, it's it's more it feels more natural. And we put a place to change it to a like a, a Japanese person's or Asian person's photograph that makes the template more natural. That is the number one. Number two, like UX, UI, like example in the homepage thumbnails, like uh, first we have those like thumbnails in, in the homepage of Canva, like YouTube, like let's say, let's see this presentation. This shows a uh, English presentation template, but uh, I thought like it has to be a Japanese template that we have to show. So here, after that, after we, we changed to all the Japanese templates. That is, and this is on, this is homepage thumbnails as an example, but I did it, we did it in many places. And number three, this is the big, this made the biggest impact. Like uh, we increased Japanese fonts in Canva. We used to have like, uh, it was like less than hundred, but at last year we had, 100 Japanese template, uh, Japanese fonts, and we increased to over 400 plus. And uh, yep, we increased the fonts and we announced, we did a press release and we like uh, announced on our social media accounts and users love it. Users love it. And not only users, because we increased the temp uh, Japanese fonts, like, uh, big, uh, like other Japanese, like partner company of uh, companies, uh, came to us to do our collaborative campaigns. So it was cool. It was nice. Yes. Yeah. Hope that's that great. Oh. No, it's it's so important, right? Um, and I mean, uh, from what I hear customization, uh, knowing your customers and localization mm. is also a key to success for Japan. So well done to you and Canva for recognizing Thank that. Thank so you. I've got one last question for you, um, yep. Suji, if that's okay. Um, Canva has already been so successful in Japan, even with your very hardworking but small team. So Suji, even you know today's theme is Startup Masterclass. Can you share with the audience what you think your secret of success for Japanese, um, you know, whether it's a big team or a small team? Wow, Ooh. <laughs> such a great question, Vivian. Secret of success, uh, yes. I have, I prepared, I thought about, I think there's like four things come to mind. Like one is, uh, luckily I had, I have a deep knowledge and experience and network in the market. 
So that benefits to like go-to-market strategy creation and also recruiting and business development. So that is one. And two, like, oh, this is crucial. Like, uh, luckily we get to build a high performance team. Like from the skill point of view, like uh, every person in the Japan team in Canva, they are highly skilled for each specialty. And the second point is, I think is more, uh, it, it, it makes a difference. Like the, cult, the culture fit and the culture building of the team. Our, the, the Japan team is like by far the high, highest collaborative team in the local in among the local teams in worldwide in Canva. And we we communicate so smoothly and uh, yeah, without any hesitation. And like so awesome products happens like so many times. And uh, we have a culture, like we get to build a culture that we can, we try many new things and keep learning. And that means like, yeah, like my team members can fail try new things and we fail that's okay we got data and learn and so we can brush up our hypothesis and next time our chance of success is is will we get higher so that's we get we get a higher team uh, uh, high performance team and third is strategy and so yeah we recreate strategy every season or every like yeah we we always have a strategy and uh so the team knows where to focus and 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 what and 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 we can create impact and uh, without a focus we can't succeed yeah can't succeed unless we focus so because we are we have limited resource like uh, we need to like focus and uh, get everything, everybody together and collaborate. Like, because we are like super highly collaborative team, now our strategy theme is hyper collaboration. And uh, we are trying to like collaborate within the Japan team and collaborate within with Japan team and the global team and collaborate with external partners. So make our collaboration like even even better so that way we'll create more impact with same amount of resource and last like um, i think the leadership team he have kept believed in us so yes so i i so we have autonomy and uh yeah and i feel very trusted by the leadership team yeah, and uh, I cannot appreciate enough. Yeah, so I think that's it for me. Thank you, Suji. That's so insightful. Important to have great leadership. Important to invest in your people, mm. and important to have a strategy. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing such fantastic advice, um, and your experience. Thank you, Suji. Thank you. Um, so, so much. now. Thank you. So now we're moving to our second speaker for the day. Uh, I'd like to welcome Mr. Um, Rashid Kostla um, from the IPG, uh, IGPI, sorry, a seasoned strategy consulting professional from uh, with a rich experience in leading and executing engagements for Fortune 500 businesses, among other things. Rashid has advice clients on market entry, growth and innovation topics across many industries. Welcome, Rashid, and over to you. Thank you, Vivian, for a good chat and, and introducing me. Yeah, I'll just share my screen. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, so I hope everyone can see my slides. So good afternoon once again. Uh, if you've been introduced me, so just quickly building on to that. So yes, I have been doing innovation advisory for a decade plus across Asia Pacific. My name is Rachid Khosla and I head IGPI in Australia. Uh, 
Previously, I used to work for IGPI in Singapore. I'll quickly introduce IGPI in a minute. And uh, one of my core focus areas at IGPI right now is focusing on the Australia-Japan Innovation Corridor as the pick on the lower right would tell you. So before I introduce IGPI, my quick opening remarks, uh, because I understand that the most of the audience today are Australian startups who are looking at either the Japanese market or collaborating with Japanese corporations. So I think it's a very good time to be in this Australia-Japan Innovation Corridor. Uh, Historically speaking, Australia and Japan for innovation were not each other's first port of call. Japan was looking at markets such as US and other markets uh, outside Japan. And even Australian startups were, you know, not, Japan was not their first market that they were wanting to expand to. But in the last couple of years, things have really changed and accelerated for good. There are success cases that are coming out. Some examples on the screen, Hivery, for example, is a retail AI bending machine solution that's partnering with a very large train company in Japan called JR East. Isatena is a Perth-based uh, surveillance tech company and it's partnering with NEC. Uh, Lavo is a hydrogen storage company that's signed the MOU with Itochu, which is a massive Japanese trading house. Sumitomo Mitsui uh, Construction Corporation is doing a demonstration project with a Australian company that's focused on load rotation that goes into construction. So you can see the diversity of the sectors by means of this. So uh, in, 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 in my presentation, I would want to touch upon various nuances of Australia, Japan, and how the innovation is happening between them. But please note that this is not a Japan business culture session. So I'll not be definitely talking about exchanging name cards with both hands, et cetera. Uh, so introducing IGPI, uh, the company I work for, it stands for Industrial Growth Platform Incorporation. It's a Tokyo headquartered corporation founded about 16 years ago. And it's a hybrid of a consulting firm of venture capital and private equity all rolled into one. We are 6,000 staff at, at a group level. So a few offices in Japan, two in Southeast Asia. I'm based in Melbourne. We have a China office as well. And Finland, we opened our first investment office. We launched a venture capital with uh, Japanese mega corporations such as Honda, Panasonic, and Omron. It's called Nordic Ninja. In Australian dollar terms, it's 150 million Australian dollars. Uh, in, in our couple of years of operation, we already have had the pleasure of having three unicorns in our portfolio now. So seeing our unique business model, it's very rare for professional firms to attract institutional shareholding, but we are fortunate to have many prominent Japanese corporations as our shareholders. For example, SMBC, which is one of the biggest banks of Japan, KDDI, which is like the Optus or Telstra of Japan, Sumitomo, which is a big trading house, so on and so forth. If you look at any ecosystem, whether it's within a country or across border, there are six key stakeholders that make the innovation ecosystem successful. Corporates, universities, startups, so com companies such as yourself in the audience, government and the ecosystem, the investors and incubators and accelerators. IGPI is unique because we add value across all these stakeholders. While I'll not bore you with all the examples, but a couple of quick ones to drive the point. For example, on the corporate side, I my super boss is on the uh, is an advisor to Honda's R and D division that focuses on new technologies. We we commercialize technologies uh, in in the university example. We commercialize technologies uh, from prominent universities such as University of Tokyo, along with Toyota, for creating new opportunities for the future. The the venture capital on the right I already spoke about, and IGPI in Australia. One of the things that I do. Uh, in my job as well, is to uh, support JETRO, which is the Austria of Japan, uh, to run two successful programs between Australia and Japan. One of them is called JBridge, which focuses exactly on the topic of today, partnering Japanese corporations with innovative companies in Australia, and also another program called Invest Japan, which helps Australian companies set up and handhold them to set up in the Japanese market. Time permitting, at the end of the presentation, I'll quickly talk about it as well. So moving on to the main topic for today, uh, stepping into shoes of Japanese corporations. So over the next couple few minutes, I would like to make six points and uh, I would suggest that you keep them in mind whether you are doing your research for your Japan market strategy or having conversations with Japanese corporations for any market. So at the 20,000 feet view, 
if you look at the the macroeconomic view of australia and japan they are they are both prominent economies of the apac region australia's gdp per capita is higher than japan but japan is three and a half times the size of as an economy so at the cost of making a very <laughs> subjective statement uh, subject to the you know the kind of business that you are doing and the issue in the market you are trying to solve for the right businesses japan's addressable market can be way bigger than australia so when you do your market research and strategy planning uh, please keep that in mind and when you rank a market for your expansion uh, beyond australia japan you know people will tell you that japan uh, has having a declining population shrinking population aging society so the market potential may be a bit questionable well it depends on exactly the the business you operate in japan is going through very interesting times so over the next three decades japan will lose up almost 25% of its population and it will go down below 100 million from about 126 million today which is basically five australias in japan uh and but at the same time there is a lot of digital transformation that is happening in japan it's never easy to map these two together but a very uh, prominent professor professor ulrike from university of california san diego i i took this from her reading material that i was referring to uh, she tried to map the declining working population and robotic shipments as an analogy for digital transformation together so japan is going through a very interesting time and for the right businesses there are a lot of opportunities so it, it it depends on you whether you look at japan as a threat or as an opportunity for innovation and also japan will go through this aging society problem before and in a more drastic way than europe or australia or other markets so the lessons from japan can be very valuable to other countries including europe australia so on and so forth so if your startup is solving issues in health aging contributing to japan's energy security food security so on and so forth then you are bound to get a very good response in your japanese conversations another thing that people might tell you that you know it's a, yes it's a true data point that japan has been losing fortune 500 companies so if you look at the chart on the left japan is the one which is in maroon so japan in 2000 used to have about 100 fortune 500 companies and now it's probably around the 50 mark china which is the pink on top came from behind and has had a very impressive run but you know it's questionable as to how important a parameter is fortune 500 companies because it, it's it's based on market capitalization which may not be the only key success factor of, of corporations in fact there is a very interesting study that was done by meti which is the ministry of economy trade and industry in japan a couple of years ago to see japan's competitiveness in deep tech so what japan is doing is japan is focusing on something which is again called by professor ulrike of university of california as an aggregate knee strategy which means that they are focusing rather than commoditized technologies they are focusing on difficult to make difficult to imitate technologies uh, so that they can compete effectively with their asian competitors and they also have a higher profit margin and when this co this competitiveness study was done the with the interesting fact don't worry about the complicated bar chart on the right what it basically means is that for a lot of those niche businesses japan's market share was as high as, as 50 percent or more in, in the world which is very a very dominant position whether it's robotics whether it's photonics electronics so on and so forth and that is across industries as you can see in the chart on the right of uh, automotive home appliances so on and so forth and by the way this study was done across 1200 products so it's not a small sample size and uh 39% of those 1200 products was more than 50%. So the, the what's the so what for you in the blue bar below? So if your startup is focusing on technologies that can contribute to those Japanese companies competitiveness and relevance, you are bound to get a very good response from Japanese corporations. So neither is aging society a challenge depending on how you see it and neither is the declining fortune 500 companies. Another thing when you approach Japan or Japanese companies to keep in mind is that Japan has changed a lot. The companies that, let's talk about the manufacturing companies in Japan. Historically, they were just selling products and basically making money and trying to sell some add-on service on top. But the world has changed very fast. We keep hearing these fancy terms, VUCA and VUCA, pandemic, VUCA for pandemic, et cetera. But yeah, basically the factors that are impacting the world are macroeconomics, like globalization, geopolitics, 
the market, which is outcome-based contracts are coming in, technologies such as IoT and other factors such as the pandemic, ESG, resource, secure, uh, resource scarcity. So what it is leading to is Japanese companies increasingly are moving to something known as servitization or XAAS, X as a service. We spoke about SaaS, I think, in, in the previous conversation. So it's XAAS, it can be for anything. There's an interesting chart below, which I'll quickly go through. Let's say a Japanese company is an elevator manufacturer. They were traditionally just selling the product. Then they were adding on a repair service. Now they're focusing on performance insights using IoT. And in future, they will also focus on predictive outcomes. And there are real examples of this happening. Toyota is having a mass strategy. This is public information. Uh, Komatsu, which is a mining and construction company, it's very interesting actually, they bought a company in Australia called Mindsight Technologies that uh, that has di digitalization and automation solutions that go into mining. So the point I'm trying to say is that when you have conversations with Japanese corporations, if you focus on XAS, you are able to provide them with a new business model or show them value of generating a new revenue stream using your products or services, you are bound to get very good interest from those Japanese corporations. Next point, I think this is very, very important and I, I, I talk about it a fair bit. When you talk, look at Japan, you should have a clear cut difference between Japan as a market and partnering with Japanese companies. Because sometimes people just think about them as one. Japanese companies have historically been growing over decades across the world. They were the first people who started expanding beyond the Japanese borders and in effect, they were building global corporations. What you see on the screen is very good data that was mapped by Austria and we, uh, we picked it from one of their reports. Uh, Japanese companies have been coming to Australia since 1950s, all the way till now. So if you're looking at Japan, a good starting point can be understanding what are those Japanese companies doing in Australia? Like if they are in commodity driven businesses, are they trying to create new businesses so that you know you can start your Japan journey from Australia or even Southeast Asia for that matter. So, and, and Japan may not be for everyone. So you need to keep that also in the equation, but you can still partner with Japanese companies who are trying to create new businesses. And just circling back to my opening remark that there is increasing interest between Australia and Japan on innovation. And I think Vivian also mentioned that in her opening remarks as well. Another point to support that, we randomly Googled some top Japanese companies to see where their CVCs or corporate venture capitals are operating. So if you see on the left, you won't find Australia, Sony, Tokyo Marine, NGK Spark Plugs, there's US, Europe, et cetera. But things are changing very fast. On the right side, you will see Intervalley Ventures, a, a, a venture capital fund based in Australia that I, I really like and highly regard for the kind of companies they invest in. They, as their website says, leveraging early stage Australian technology companies into the Japanese market. So this is happening. Taronga is New South Wales based prop tech fund and Mitsubishi and Nomura real estate, both Japanese companies have invested in Taronga. And these examples are bound to only increase. So this is also another point that Japan is looking at Australia and vice versa. So uh, we, IGPA runs uh, the program called JBridge, as I mentioned about earlier on in my presentation. And we have had a number of success cases within the JBridge program, partnering Japanese corporations and innovative Australian companies for business collaboration, technical collaboration, and financial collaboration. And IGPA does work outside of that as well in this innovation corridor. So this is my last slide, and I wanted to leave some points with you that what, what are the things you can keep in mind and what are our observations as to what works when you as an Australian startup go, go to Japanese corporations. Number one, strategic mindset. So as I mentioned, if you're talking to a Toyota or a Komatsu, talk about business models, talk about revenue streams, what you bring on the table, that, is, that goes a long way. Patience and flexibility. Don't have a transactional mindset that I want to just sell my SaaS service. As I want a reseller in Japan. Be open to POCs and demonstration projects. A wider geographical view. So as I mentioned in my Japan slide uh, of expansion, don't just focus on the Japanese market. Uh, research Japanese companies and what they're doing in other parts of the world as well. Fourth point, very important observation. Don't be very brand conscious. In JBridge, one of the biggest findings that we had a lot of Japanese companies that you don't normally hear about are actually very enthusiastic and serious about open innovation and are, are talking to Australian companies. And last but not the least, cultural sensitivity, please keep those things in mind 
uh, you, there are a lot of materials on the internet, so I've not included it in my presentation, like consensus, consensus driven decision making, respect for hierarchy, risk averseness, so on and so forth. There is a long list, but the internet is flooded with all this. So yeah, those are the things and I, I wish you the best for your Japan endeavors. Thank you and back to Vivian. Thank you so much, Rashid. This is so insightful, um, really good points. And I'm quite sure, um, you know, our group of listeners are learning a lot from IGPI and I encourage everyone actually to participate in the JBridge. And I'm sure you can reach out to IGPI as well for advice if you need to. Um, just a reminder to everyone, uh, thank you, Rashid, um, to go to Slido, um, hashtag Global Tech, if you have any questions. So moving on to our final speaker for today, I'd like to welcome Mr. Joshua Flannery to the session. Josh is a recognized innovation ecosystem leader in both Japan and Australia as the co-founder and CEO of Innovation Dojo Japan. With an extensive range of experience working with entrepreneurs and startups, Josh has some fantastic and hands-on experience with startups succeeding in Japan. Thanks and over to you, Josh. Thank you, Vivian, and uh, thanks, Rachit and Shuji, for your uh, interesting presentations. Hard app to follow, uh, but let me try to get straight into this. Um, everything's opening. There we go. Okay. So uh, this uh, particular session is focused on B2B business development or sales uh, in the context of Australian tech companies or startups or scale-ups, uh, depending on where you consider yourself uh, entering Japan for the first time. So um, please call me Josh. I am originally from Sydney. Um, I first started working in tech-related world uh, back in 2004. I worked for a SaaS company called Learning Information Systems, and we, um, we took that company into Japan uh, way before any of uh, a lot of the great resources that were talked about uh, earlier existed. And so I cut my teeth on uh, market entry with a, a, an Aussie SaaS company back in the mid 2000s. And since then, I've been doing a lot of work supporting startups. So I had a, a really uh, enjoyable and great run at the University of New South Wales, uh, building the programs there. And um, then that followed uh, a government gig with the Sydney Startup Hub. Um, and uh, later, I, I moved back to Japan. And uh, for a few years, I ran a venture market entry program called Startup Bootcamp Scale Osaka as the country manager for a European firm called Rainmaking in Japan. And then um, more recently, uh, coming up to two years now, I, I've been working uh, full-time on Innovation Dojo, which is a, a company we founded in Sydney uh, about seven years ago now. And we've always been working uh, in and around startups, entrepreneurship, innovation related initiatives. Um, originally just between Australia and Japan, but more so now between Japan and, and everywhere else in the world. Um, tiny bit about uh, our uh, Japan business. So uh, call it an ecosystem business. We have about, uh, well, we have a, three different focuses. Uh, the foundation stage one is about creating uh, entrepreneurial talent that can work across border. So we partner with uh, universities to design and deliver content that helps produce uh, such talent. So uh, we're working with Japan's Ministry of Education on a five-year program that's just started this year in that area. And that work flows up to the next stage where we're incubating or um, almost concierging startups from around the world, including Australia, into corporate Japan, um, into uh, the angel investors and also the venture capital and corporate venture capital uh, options that are now, um, as mentioned in the previous uh, talk, are really aggressively looking for great uh, startups and, and te technologies. Um, and, and Australia is increasingly becoming um, noted as a 
potential source for that. And the top stage is uh, when we get closer to a transaction. So um, a subset of, of the companies that we help are becoming more interesting as a potential uh, partner for a Japanese corporation or a potential investee, or perhaps they're looking to um, go come into Japan or vice versa, go out from Japan. And so we do some work in that area too. Um, we have a relatively small team, but uh, we are a platform style of service. So we have a, a network of about 50 different Japanese corporations that work with us across our programs. Um, we've actually got agreements with uh, 65 mentors or kind of consultants that uh, depending on what your uh, niche of technology or stage of company is, we bring them in to support our projects. Uh, most recently, we have um, unleashed a new network of uh, 6,000 bilingual Japanese researchers and scientists through a partnership we have with a group called United Japanese Academics. And uh, we're using uh, that new workforce to help this kind of cross-border innovation, particularly in Japan. So to the more interesting stuff, what do um, startup founders in you know, this year or last year actually think about their experience when they've been working in Japan and trying to develop their businesses there? Um, I have surveyed uh, a, a small cohort, about 13 uh, of startups. Two of them were Australian. Actually, one of them was um, Isatana mentioned uh, recently uh, just by uh, Rachit in the in the previous uh, the previous slides he showed uh, as doing a, a deal with NEC. But this, this group, um, they were actively flying in for a program, a market entry program. And uh, this was the kind of spectrum from uh, the, the more difficult and challenging elements to doing uh, business and business development and sales in Japan on the left through to the, uh, the more exciting parts on the right. And I think this mirrors uh, what both of the previous speakers have said but it's better to hear it directly from the startup founders. So um, on the right, you know, uh, some of the just facts. So it's a big market, depend, you know, not for every uh, industry, but generally um, th there's, there's still a much bigger consumer market and uh, maybe more excitingly in B2B, um, there, there is just a phenomenal amount of capital floating around looking for, startups and, and other uh, SMEs with technologies to help that digital transformation that everyone's talking about. But what it really means is Big Japan is desperate. Uh, a lot of the companies are uh, falling behind their competitors and they need to invest aggressively in uh, firstly just competing with their, um, their, their counterparts on the ground in Japan let alone globally. So you have this um, accelerated activity, you know, uh, of, of uh, teams that are dedicated to hunting for startups to work with, which is something that's not that common in Australia, but it's, it's really probably the one big advantage of the Japan startup ecosystem. So there's a lot of weaknesses, uh, mainly in, in the development of their own startups, all that, that's changing, but as a destination for startups to go into and look for lucrative partnerships and, and customers, it, it has been and still is um, a very good time to, to go in and, and see if there is a, an opportunity there for your company. Um, some of the other interesting points that were uh, brought up, uh, customer loyalty. So this, this is a bit of a, uh, a double-edged sword so you'll hear a lot on, on the negative side of things that, you know, there's this long sales cycle and it's sometimes very difficult to uh, close that first sale or the first, uh, get your very first customer and your first Japan story. Um, the flip side of that is um, it, it's in a way harder to lose a Japanese customer. So when it comes uh, time for renewing contracts, um, it's more um, because there's been so much more time 
invested on the Japan corporate side uh, leading up to the beginning of your contract. There's a little bit more of a risk that, uh, you know, face will be lost. Uh, there'll be some embarrassment if, if uh, a contract only went for one year or, or one term. So um, you do have a, a higher likelihood because of that unusual um, kind of length of decision making process that it will work in your favor once you start to getting your first customers. Um, I, I think that's probably it. A lot of this is being covered uh, by, by the other speakers. So, um, you know, we, we've heard some examples of different ways to go in. Um, and I thought it was really interesting to hear of Canva's story, trying the partnership and then opting for the um, in-house country manager. Um, so this is kind of a, a map of all those different kind of options that, that you have. Um, you'll always hear in almost every um, session of this kind related to business in Japan generally that uh, partnerships and trust are, are a big focus. Um, it's definitely true in terms of partnerships um, and, uh, you know, depending on the industry you're going into, um, there may be very specific categories of companies that should be the go-to for, for partnerships as your first step. So for example, if you're a, a cybersecurity uh, tech company, you'd be looking at systems integrators and distributors. Whereas um, if you were a, uh, you know, an IoT platform or um, a straight out IT um, play, you might have a, another option where you could look at some of the um, market entry programs that are growing across Japan. Uh, so some of them are uh, government backed, others are private company backed. And uh, essentially what they do is um, design uh, within three to six months an opportunity for you to um, execute a proof of concept within the program. And so unlike, um, they're sometimes called accelerator programs, but um, unlike probably the, the local accelerators that you're used to, um, it, it's very much more about um, executing a project with one or more partners during that uh, three to six months, as opposed to um, that kind of more mentor driven and uh, you know, focus on how much your company's growing particular metrics each week. So uh, that, that's a huge thing in Japan um, for market entry. So look out for um, corporate backed or, or corporate partnered uh, accelerator programs, which are really just an, another way to um, start your market entry. Um, as, as Shuji mentioned, you know, hiring your own country manager is, is always a good option. Um, and also acting as proxy country managers, uh, consultants. Um, so... Uh, uh, an increasing number of consulting companies are offering white label country manager uh, human resources. So you, you can actually, um, without physically having someone there, uh, hire someone effectively who's um, technically employed by a consulting firm, but they, they carry your business cards and, and they, they'll go by your email address and what have you. So that, that's a bit of a snapshot. Um, I'm not sure how we're doing for time, Vivian. Should I, should I look at wrapping up there? I think so. I'm so sorry. It's so, so interesting. But if you could wrap up, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Um, just quickly. So um, I would suggest before spending any money at all, search for the free support available. So obviously we have um, Austrade services and their equivalents, Jetro, for the, on the Japan side, but there's also at the prefectural and city government level, an increasing number of free uh, kind of landing pad like services where you'll have a bilingual um, person who's ready to answer your questions and potentially help you with company registration in Japan or introducing you to potential partners. Um, got some considerations here, but I think we probably don't have time. So um, I might just stop there, Vivian, and leave that up for anyone that wants to take a screenshot. Um, and uh, otherwise, yeah, thanks so much for your time. And um, 
Also, uh, I'll leave my details here if anyone is keen to uh, contact me directly. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, um, Josh. That was absolutely fascinating. I love your opportunities and challenge slides a lot. That's so true. Um, now, I, I apologize to the people who are attending, um, but we're going to have to do Q&A offline. Um, I need to wrap up now, so uh, just in interest of time. Firstly, thank you to all the fantastic speakers for your valuable insights, contributions, and efforts for today's session. We really appreciate your, your expert guidance. In closing, I'd like to point out that there uh, really are a broad range of events that Australian startups can join, um, some of which are hybrid and you can participate online, which I encourage you to think about. Um, the events you can see on the screen right now a light touch way to test your products and services with potential end users in the market and get real world feedback. Please feel free to take a screenshot or keep an eye on Australia's social media channels for more information or just reach out to us you know, in Japan um, if you want uh, to know what's best for you. Finally, I'd like to give you a heads up um, about, uh, uh, we're launching this uh, on the 21st of November. It's called the FinTech Playbook. I'm sure this will be a useful guide for those thinking of entering Japan. There's some very, um, some generic advice. So even if you're not in the FinTech space, I encourage you to have a look at this um, and, and figure and pick, you know, what insights you find most useful. Um, uh, also on, on Japanese subsidies, government subsidies to support your business expansion. Uh, I'm sure you, um, uh, you know, businesses from all sectors will find this useful, um, even as I said, beyond fintech. Um, so um, thank you. If anyone has um, any other questions, please feel free to reach out to us. I encourage you um, to contact the Australia team. Um, and we're looking forward to working with you in Japan. Thank you so much for participating. And thanks to all our panelists as well. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, thank cool. you, Vivian. I'll uh, just do a quick, quick wrap up. Um, again, just huge thank you to all the speakers. Joshua, sorry, we um, we didn't quite get to finish your presentation, but please, maybe we can try to share your slides uh, uh, offline because I think there would be quite quite a few people that will be interested. And uh, and thank you, Rashid, and thank you, Shuji, as well for your incredible um, insights. Uh, and thanks, Vivian, for organising. So thank you to all the speakers. Also, just want to thank um, AAA for their ongoing support of this webinar series. I think this is the eighth webinar. Um, we've got the ninth webinar scheduled next month, which is the last one for this year, which is a highlight on India on the 6th of December, as you'll see on the screen. Keep an eye out through AIA channels and Austrade channels um, for uh, information on that event. Um, and I'd also just like to thank the Austrade team for um, uh, for kind of help, helping to pull all of these together. Um, Vivian and the team there at Post, Marnie and Charlotte and the team here back, back in Australia. And, I'll, and with that, I'll hand over to Simon. Thanks again, Simon. Thanks, David. Thanks, Vivian. Thanks, uh, all panellists. Look, I am conscious that we're four minutes uh, past the hour, so I won't say too much other than hope you enjoyed it, learnt something. Uh, Australia's got a lot of information that can support any businesses that want to go into a very fascinating and large market in Japan. Thank you all. See you next time. Bye-bye.